have an interesting question to discuss today, which is whether we should actually be here or not. Uh, get to that in a second. I just wanted to share one announcement with you because it's uh, on the Valentine's Day wavelength. And uh, there, I'll just read it to you. This is uh, coming from Colombia. Wives, yeah, wives and girlfriends of gang members. Uh, Padilla? Padilla. Wives and girlfriends of gang members in Ferreira say they will not have sex with them until they vow to give up violence. That's cruel. That is cruel. Oh, I thought you said cruel. No, cruel. Cruel. Yeah. Those of you who are familiar with uh, ancient Greek literature, show of hands, please. <laughs> There's a, a comedy by Aristophanes based on this very theme. And uh, apparently it worked very well. So it might be one technique we'd want to consider in our yes. nonviolent repertoire. So, but before we go any further, uh, a suggestion has been conveyed to me that as part of the um, show of support and solidarity for student strikes that are starting to pop up all over the country, really. This is. Uh, as far as the UC system is concerned, it started in, in Santa Barbara, a group who was here last time. And there's a small group at Sonoma State College, which is the flagship of the state college system that's having a camp out on their, on their uh, campus. And uh, we're going to have this rally at noon, which doesn't affect us directly, but someone has suggested to me. Huh? 10 of 11. 10 of 11. It's at 11. Oh, I see. But still, we are not directly affected uh, by that. But someone has uh, passed on the suggestion to me that we not have class today or that we have it out on the lawn in solidarity with that uh, event. So I have my own feelings about that, which, as you know, I will share with you <laughs> very shortly. But I wanted to us to think about this uh, strategically, you know, given some of the criteria that we're beginning to build now for a model to understand what is appropriate, what is effective nonviolent action. What are the, some of the parameters of the situation that we are in right now that might affect our decision whether we go out or, or stay? I mean, having, having framed it that way, I want to say I, I am not going to take attendance today. Very dramatic move because you know I never take attendance. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> no, that's a, no pain, no gain <laughs> situation. <laughs> but uh, suppose somebody came to you, I mean, someone just did, namely me, and <laughs> said, you know, maybe we shouldn't be here today as a show of solidarity for the anti war protests that are starting up. What are some of the considerations we might take into account to decide? What would be the thing we want to do? Okay. I personally like the compromise we propose to have uh -huh. the class in the lawn. Uh -huh. So we're not missing all the information, but at the same time we're showing the support by being there, uh -huh. not being physically in here. Uh -huh. And the administration could even tell if we're having a class or uh -huh. is that just group of students talking to a professor? <laughs> So Roberto said the, uh, he likes the compromise <coughs> solution that I inadvertently proposed. Uh, there's a couple of things wrong with it. One is it'd be a disaster for the webcasting, right? <laughs> uh, our technology isn't there yet to do all that with camera, with a uh, battery. And another thing is the, very, the last thing that you mentioned, doesn't that kind of render it a little bit vacuous in terms of the protest? If the administration doesn't know that we're protesting, by meeting outside and on. What value does it have as a protest? And then the question would become, no, I won't even go there. I just want to hear from you first. Catherine? Um, I don't know. It seems kind of highly symbolic to me and because like, mm -hmm. nobody would actually know, not even the protesters really even know. Yeah, there is. Except for like, the people in the class. Yeah. Um, but mm -hmm. like, it just seems to me like it wouldn't do much good. So Catherine is saying that it seems like it would be a symbolic rather than a concrete move in the sense that we have come to have some suspicions of? Yeah, no, I, I agree with that, but I was going to say um, even more specifically, I think um, that it's important that we're meeting with the 
given the subject matter, yeah. it's important Thank for you for mentioning it. Yeah. Yeah. This is a course in nonviolence. <laughs> it would be good to remember that when you're writing your paper. And I am going to hand out a thing about how to write papers in the world. In fact, why don't I just hand it around? Um, but yeah, to put this in my own framework, I have come to feel that nonviolent actions should always be very clear. And uh, we're going to discuss the borderline nature of a lot of the activities in the uproar resistance pretty soon. But to shut down a nonviolence class, to punish a university, which isn't even paying for the class, <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> which doesn't know that it exists, which wishes that it would go away <laughs> as a means of protesting against the war being declared by a policy elite in Washington, I think we've lost clarity by you know, six or eight layers. Mike? Now that is a very uh, astute suggestion and you may be aware that this was a critical moment in the Viet anti-Vietnam protests. There was a, uh, a small group of professors, what do you call a small group of professors? A gaggle of professors, <laughs> I guess, or whatever they were, at the uh, University of Colorado Boulder, which is, you know, the second or third most liberal campus in the country. Uh, and they got tired of shutting down their conflict resolution classes in order to protest the war. And some of them came up with the idea at a meeting one day, why don't we have a teach in instead of a teach out? And instead of shutting down what they want us to do, why don't we do what we want to do? And you can see why this appeals to me immediately because that's a powerful example of a uh, constructive program that you, you do something positive instead of or, or instead of not doing something negative, and when the time comes to do the negative thing, you're in a better position to do that. I was also thinking about the appropriateness of not coming to class because according to what I understood about the rally, we shouldn't go to class only if it's more competent to rally. Right. Well, I, I think all of uh, Sadie's points were relevant. That we're at the beginning of a process and it may be too big of a jump to shut down classes at this point. It would be different if the class really interfered with the rally and people wanted to go to the rally. And I, should, I would love it, personally, if all of you people went straight to the rally and told them what we discussed here. That's, that's partly what we're about. Let me, let me bring up another issue that may not be as clear to you, but it is to me because of my personal experience. Uh, okay, the Apoor Rebellion that we just saw this film about, and we're going to be talking about either here or on the lawn or in a cafe or something in a little while, it started with students. And this is one thing that I have never tried to conceal that I think without student protest energy, Nothing of value is going to happen in this country or anywhere else. That, that's where I stand on that. But at the same time, if you stack up the free speech movement, that's where my personal experience comes in. Oh, and incidentally, I wanted to share something very uh, exciting with you on a little personal note. I think I found my picture in the free speech cafe. I'm sitting there having a latte. I put my cup down. There I was, I think. So I'm going to go in and circle myself, and we can all pay homage. Okay. And, and distraction. Back to the point. The free speech movement, the uprising of the Apoor students in Belgrade in 1998, the uprising eight years earlier of Kosovar Albanian students in Kosovo at the University of Pristina, many other examples that I could mention, started because of the repression at the university. Now, the university is in bed with the war system in various ways, but to shut down the university because of 
so with this, you know, with this policy elite of about 290 people that a friend of mine calls the world domination, global dominance group, who is really running the country. Because of what that group is doing in Washington to, sh to interfere with things at Berkeley strikes me as inaccurate, to, to say the least. And to say a little more, there is this tendency for people to protest and rebel against whoever is closest to them, not against the people causing the difficulty. And this can even be manipulated in our disfavor. If you think of a famous October or February, I guess it was, in 03, when the Gulf War, or the present war, started in Iraq, people almost shut down San Francisco. San Francisco is like the most anti-war city in the country, but they happened to live there, so they went out and blocked the traffic and so forth. Now to put even a little more spin on this, if you uh, will permit me, uh, the perception of the university in the 60s was very different from the perception of the university now, such that shutting down the university in 1964, which we basically accomplished, <laughs> had a very different social impact than it would have now. Unfortunately, I think we have lost the value of universities on many levels, and this is a political level. And just to, again, bring this out with one iconic story, as a classics professor, I'm very much aware of the work of a, a brilliant uh, philosopher, ancient Greek philosophy person by the name of Bruno Snell, who was a philosopher, who was at um, Göttingen, I believe. And uh, during World War II, during World War II, every morning, Bruno Snell would go to his office, he would walk up the steps to his you know, gothic building, all these ironic columns. People will have gathered waiting for him to do this. Every single morning, he walked up to the door of his building, he turned around and he said to the crowd, Hitler is ein Schwein. Now, for those of you who <laughs> are, Amy, give us a chance. <laughs> Yes, thanks. Sorry, I had to make you use that two-letter word. Yeah, Hitler is a pig. In Germany during World War II. And how did he get away with it? Because he was Bruno Snell. He was the greatest scholar of archaic Greek literature that Germany had. You see, I, I can tell from the look of incomprehension <laughs> that what I'm saying is true. You know, I could rather say, don't, you don't dare arrest me. I'm a nonviolent scholar. I search for nonviolent future. <laughs> Nobody would have the vaguest what I'm talking about. You know, it'd be like that joke that they say that there was a communist uh, rally, a parade in New York one time, and the police broke it up, and they're beating on this guy. And the guy says, "Hey, don't hit me. I'm an anti-communist." And the police say, "I don't care what kind of communist you are." <laughs> 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 it would be sort of like that. So I, I guess you can tell by now that I'm kind of inclining towards continuing our class for various reasons. Um, but I'm perfectly happy to follow the consensus process here. If the majority of you uh, feels that we have a consensus that we should walk out, I will do that. Uh, if you want to meet on the lawn to have a consensus about that, I will do that. But personally, I think we're making our greatest contribution by just staying here and doing our thing. I can see where a time might come where a huge show of force is needed. And again, to put it back in that frame, you know, right now we have a pusillanimous Congress saying we're going to pass a non-binding resolution that we don't like your policy. But we support the troops, don't get us wrong. There's one person in Congress who said, cut off the funding, stop this nonsense about non-binding resolutions. All the rest of it. And that, of course, is Dennis Kucinich. It makes me doubly sorry that my bicycle is still on this Kucinich sticker on my bicycle. But um, the c Congress will not cut off funding for the war unless there is a grassroots, vigorous, well aimed, strategically accurate, determined student-led resistance. I, I actually believe that's true, and 
Uh, I wouldn't dream of getting in the way of such a process, but I mean, as you know, personally, I don't think the time has come yet where we can contribute to that process by not having a class. So how do you people feel? I don't know how to exactly do this. Uh, so well, I suppose let's just fall back on the old-fashioned corny method, have a show of hands. Uh, and I won't look at faces, just hands, which I know is against you. Uh, how many feel that we should just continue as we were going in? How many feel that we should uh, do something different, like go out on the wall? Okay. You, you weren't here for all these arguments. <laughs> Maria said that. So that's perfectly understandable. Oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't supposed to look at who that was. Uh, okay. How, does anyone else have any other suggestions? Yeah. You know. Mm -hmm. You know, group to maybe put some emphasis in directing some kind of plan and how we can yeah. go about that yeah. in, in the classroom. Maybe that could yeah. be contributing to. So I mean, we could do it in this classroom, and I think we could actually do it through the medium of looking at what the odd four students did <laughs> and see how we would you know, fold in with that. Yeah. Yeah, we have a mole right here in this class. We have a political science major right here. You can, you can actually get into Barrows Hall or get past the security barricade. So now let's think about doing this. That's very much in line with what I was about to suggest, which is something that I always like to do, which is if there's an event that is basically aiming at the right thing, but which I can't participate in for one reason or another, I usually try to do something else. And at the very least, let's try to just rededicate ourselves to understand how real this is, how important it is, lives are at stake. And if we get this right here, we can find a way to feed the insights and the intelligence that we're gathering into this process. So having said that, this is a perfect segue. This, this, today's class is going to seem fairly well organized by standards. Of <laughs> I'm just not saying much. Uh, Amy gave us a presentation on this group that spoke on campus. And I think she was too modest to bring out one point which I want to emphasize. And that is this group of people, these young people, were very angry. The, you could feel it just walking through the room saying, ar, ar, ar. pictures of people being tortured, plastered all over the world. Uh, so they were very angry. So up to this point, we have no problem with that, right? This, uh, this is the energy that we, again, projecting my own views onto everybody. <laughs> I guarantee you I'll stop this after the final exam. But we, if we are in this non-principled, non-violent bag, we're not afraid of anger. We're not afraid of other people's anger, of course. And we're not afraid of our own because we know something to do with it. And in this connection, one of the best expressions of this is uh, something that Martin Luther King said about the anger in the civil rights movement. And you can imagine how extreme that anger was on both sides. He said, we did not express anger and we did not repress it. We let it out under discipline for maximum effect. We let it out under discipline for maximum effect. Okay. So up to this point, the fact that this group is angry is not making us angry. <laughs> but as we've been discussing, there's two very different directions you can go with that. The low road is where anger deepens into hatred, and the high road is where anger is exalted into rage. And the key difference, uh, thank you, Michael, is whether you take a personal and that, again, has two faces. I'm in this because it's an offense to me. How dare they? You know, I've seen 1,500 advertisements already this week, and they all told me how important I was. 
So after it has anyone there be against me. And you are the problem. So it's ad hominem. A Latin expression meaning you're against the person. Ad hominem. So when you depersonalize the anger, it starts climbing up into what we're calling rage or furia. And you could use that to change the world. But if you just let it fester, it can get extreme without getting useful. Okay? So this group was, I think, about here <laughs> in that process. They're, they're heading down. And uh, I felt very frustrated about it. And I wanted to say something about it, but I had to go off to another lecture. Little did I know that one of our most brilliant students was in the back row. And she, no names please, actually went and talked to these people and had a remarkable response from one of them, which was, if I'm paraphrasing this correctly, Amy, yeah, we're, we are sort of interested in this nonviolent stuff. Tell us more about it. What is it about? And interestingly enough, here's another interesting wrinkle. Of the three people who were on the panel, four people who were on the panel, the one who showed most interest was the military person. He started out his talk by saying, 17 days ago, I was a Marine in Iraq. And now I'm here being, uh, risking arrest, protesting against the war. Remember Gandhi's famous discovery? I can make a nonviolent person, a satyagrahi, out of a violent person. I cannot make a satyagrahi out of a coward. So I think it's quite significant there was a military person who picked up on it, but it's also an example of the value of what we're doing here and why I'm reluctant to shut it down today because I think this growing reaction, and I'm using that word advisedly, this growing reaction against the war needs direction very badly and nobody goes around studying this stuff. So this downturn that they were exhibiting showed all the characteristics that we would warn them to watch out for. One is it's very ad hominem. I hate those people so much. I mean, do I love those people? No. I mean, if you can hate anybody, hate them, but you know that's not going to get us anywhere. Secondly, it was entirely negative. Yeah, like no, no positive alternative. All they were saying is have a culture of protest, which I think is correct. An individual protest will not get us anywhere. A cultural protest will might, but it won't get us over that hump into constructive programming if we really get somewhere. And I think actually that this sort of thing, if I may say so, it was so 1970s. There were very few students there. And I felt sorry for them in a way, but I think that ultimately, and Gandhi said this, a negative campaign will never get the kind of have the kind of appeal that a positive campaign will have. It has to be positive but not naive, uh, not unrealistic, will galvanize energies and give people hope. I almost said Barack Obama, but I mean hope. <laughs> in a way that a negative campaign will not. Uh, see, I thought of a couple of other things. So in other words, it was all you know, about protest and so forth. And I guess we can consider that as one. It was raw anger instead of anger expressed under discipline for maximum effect. It seems to me I had one other characteristic where I said to me, I, I just know that's wrong, and I know that anyone from Pax 164 would be able to point this out to them. And I can't remember at the moment what it is. Oh, yes, I can. Uh, the analysis was entirely political. Period, end of quote. Now, I'm not saying there's no such thing as politics. There's no such thing as a political analysis. But the cause of this horror that's going on in Iraq and again, I totally agree that it is a horror. The cause of it is capitalism. Get rid of the capitalist system and you get rid of all of these problems. 
Um, actually, I don't think that's true. I mean, human beings have a spiritual dimension, a political dimension, an outer dimension, a body in most cases. <laughs> and all of these things have to be taken into account, abarcado, they have to be embraced, and they all have to be structured in the right way. So those are the four things that uh, we would look to be sharing with these people if we get a, a chance to carry further with this. And we, we, we know we well might. All right, so that was a very dramatic film that we saw on Tuesday. Thanks to John, we've got the equipment working correctly. Uh, I have you know, several things that I, I want to make sure that we get covered. But I think I'd like to just turn it up over to you and ask you, what did you notice? And perhaps we should start filling in our boxes of categories. Yeah. Um, the part that I liked best was kind of near the end when uh -huh. they, um, they said that the police were also victims. Yes. And there was a quote that said, like, some of the victims are the victims. Yes. Yeah, all of those points are very good. I mean, the fact that they said to the police, look, we're not against you, okay? So it's not ad hominem. We're definitely in the right ballpark. But we also have to mesa permanente, or however you say that in Serbo Croatian. We, this, you can't stop us. We will not allow you to stop us. This must be done. And pointing out to the police that they are as much victims of the system as they are. That's super important. When Gandhi was in London for the farcical roundtable conference in 1931. Knowing at once that it was going to be a farce, he decided to use his time by contacting certain elements in, in Britain. And among others, he asked to visit the Lancashire clothing mills, which is so Gandhi. You know, I think some of you will remember this story that he was touring somewhere in northern India his people came to him and said, don't go any further down that road because there's a village down there. The village headman has sworn to kill you on sight. And Gandhi said, oh, really? What's his name? Let's go there. And he said, no, 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 you don't understand. Gandhi said, oh, yeah, I understand. So he went and he went up to the door of this man's hut and knocked on it. The guy opened the door. He was quite startled. And Gandhi said, I'm here to help you fulfill your vow. So this person, uh, taken somewhat by surprise, he, okay, <laughs> reached out and started choking Gandhi. And Gandhi has just been repeating his mantra like gangbusters. Mm -hmm. Did not try to physically defend himself. And after what must have seemed like a fairly long period of time to Gandhi, the fellow dropped his hands and then fell at his feet. And he said, this whole village is at your disposal. So. I'm sorry, why am I talking about this? <laughs> 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 was, yes. yes, thank you, thank you. Uh, it's very important. I need several of you in the front row to do that. <laughs> uh, so Gandhi gets to Britain and he has brought about a cloth boycott, which has put like 100,000 textile workers in Lancashire out of work. And he says, I want to go there. And he went there. It took him like two hours to completely convince those people that some of that you're as much victimized by this system as I am. He said, "Don't even dream of bringing back the old cloth trade. It victimizes you and victimizes us." And he said to them, "I want you to stop and think who is exploiting you." And this is one of the reasons why I was so keen on having our protest when the time comes be against the people against whom we really have to be, against whom we really have to be. So, uh, yeah, to be able to go to the police and say, look, you're a victim of the system. And <coughs> you might remember when we discussed civilian-based defense, I said that the way that works is when soldiers have come in, you say to them, look, you, we're, you and I are on the same side. You should not be fighting against us. Okay. While we're on this topic of the function of the police, 
Remember Mayor Illich. I think that's his name. From the city of Chachak. And uh, his dramatic convoy down to Veligradi, Belgrade, uh, was actually being watched by the entire nonviolence community, which is very easy to do because we all fit in one room with a six inch television screen. You can see it very easily. But uh, it, was, it bears some resemblance and perhaps some comparison to a famous event that took place in India. Any people want to chime in here? Or anyone who's sneakily done some reading about the freedom struggle in India, climax of it? The salt, the salt march. Yeah, because you know, Gandhi could have gotten on a special train and been down to Dandian overnight, but instead he decided to walk. So he sets out with 70 people from his ashram, and by the time he gets down to the seashore, 12 days later, he has probably something like 70,000. So this is not dissimilar. It is the, it's a good example of, you know, I've been, been dissing symbol users all along, so let me say, I think this is an excellent example of the way to use symbols. That is not to go for the symbol, but to go for the concrete reality. I have to get to Belgrade. That's where the government is. I've got to turn these people out of that building. Or there's no salt here in the desert, <laughs> in the Deccan Plateau. I've got to get down to the seashore to collect it. So you have a concrete act which takes on symbolic proportions. And that's gold. That's pure gold. So this convoy was you know, very closely watched uh, by us and as scrupulously ignored by the world's media. That, that's their job, to ignore nonviolence until the world crumbles into dust, I suppose. Pardon my bitterness. I get this close to Northgate Hall, it starts creeping up on me. Um, but while we've got him up here, let me, let me bring to your mind his famous little talk uh, on the steps of the parliament building where he said, don't throw stones at the police, don't throw anything at the police, dot, dot, dot. What else did he say? Do I remember that? <coughs> of course, this is unfair. I've seen the thing about 10 times. Yes? I think the, they're on our side. They're, on, they're coming over to our side, right. Okay. So don't throw stones because followed by a strategic reason. And I thought this is neat. You might have heard me murmuring to myself over here. This is neat, I murmured. Because we can position this. How, uh, let's talk about it. How do you feel about this comment? Don't throw any at anything at the police. They're coming over to our side. Anybody see what's missing in this equation? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, you go ahead, Amy. We'll okay. John gets funny. Well, isn't it kind of like strategic to all that? Yeah, in the kind of like. If life. they were coming over to our side, yeah. Stones yeah. If they, if they don't, hit them with everything you've got. <laughs> right. So let, let's say that this is the strategic nonviolence position. What would the PNV position be? John. Period, end of quote, right, right. <laughs> no stones, period. Or you might go on to say, don't throw stones at the police because there is that of God in every man. Or <laughs> something, something like that from 164. That would depend whom you are speaking to. Uh, and then, of course, I don't know why I'm putting this up on top, but there's the violence position, which is, you know, health away, you know. And we've talked about the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the fact that the kids, the Shabab, the testosterone-filled youth, throw stones at IDF soldiers and how ambiguous that is because they'd like you to think about it as an act of defiance and partly has that character, but it also is injurious force. So it has a violence character and there you go. Okay, great. So that was a good start. Uh, what else? Yes, Kathy. Um, I had 
a question about something that like seems kind of irrelevant in film, but uh, mm -hmm. they like showed this book which uh, which was about nonviolence and yeah. it said nonviolent coercion. Yes. And that just seems kind of weird to me because we're supposed yes. to be doing I'm glad that the concept of nonviolent coercion seemed weird to you. This is one of several schemas that we have in the Zunas, Kurtz, and Osher book. One is a five-part schema that we talked about in connection with the Philippines. And this is another one which talks about, uh, I, you know, I'm sorry, I'm going to forget what the other elements are, but the final one is nonviolent <coughs> coercion, and that means you have brought so much pressure on the opponent that he or she has really no rational, no practical choice but to go along with you regardless of whether he or she believes what you're doing. And we have said that this is not principle of nonviolence. Principle of nonviolence works always by persuasion, not coercion. That's one of our main criteria here. And it's one of the things where Coercion. Uh, I'm sorry, this is getting a little sloppy, but you could actually bracket force and coercion together as part of violence and persuasion as part of nonviolence. You would be justified in doing that. So, nonviolent coercion really does look like a contradiction in terms. It's sort of like military intelligence or business ethics. Um, so, that, that was uh, another clue, if any were needed, that the Utkor Rebellion, for all of its brilliance and success and beauty and other good things that we're going to be discussing, it was strategic nonviolence. Now, again, my own position here, I have absolutely nothing against strategic nonviolence. Given the choice between violence and strategic nonviolence, I'll go SND every day of the week. But the one objection that I do have is to think that strategic nonviolence is nonviolence. Because then when it doesn't work, you're finished. You go back to violence. So that's kind of a travesty of nonviolence to say that you, know, you learn a few strategies out of a book written by a guy at Harvard and you carry them out and work on that. And it works if it's that that's nonviolence. Other things, yes. Can we also support national team with the fact that they use That sorry? Can we also consider the fact that they use the bulldozers during their when they were going to Belgrade? Belgrade? They use bulldozers? Yeah. To you know Now that is really interesting. What are we gonna say about bulldozers? In principle Bulldozers are not instruments of persuasion, right? They are instruments of coercion. Uh, so it would, in theory, tend to line up with violence. Um, it's definitely not persuasive. But remember uh, the leader of the student uh, poor group in Belgrade. I forget his name. He's a real the cute guy got elected to the parliament. Remember him saying, this is the year. This is the year that S Serbia has to be once again in favor of life. So which we're going to talk about. But what I want to talk about right now is the timing issue. Okay? So now if you hear this is the year and you've taken Pax 164A, immediately you think, oh my gosh. Swaraj in one year. This is what Gandhi said. He comes back to India and he has a few successful things, five of them actually. <laughs> and he says, okay, we're going to have Swaraj in one year. This is 1919. And of course it didn't happen until 1947. Why, okay, um, who wants to say more about that? Well, why is that sort of okay? John or anyone? Yeah, Alex. <laughs> well, I think that Gandhi realized that Swaraj started with like a mental state. Yeah. So for him, Swaraj was for people to realize that they were free and it didn't necessarily, like even if Britain wasn't out of their Yeah. Okay, I like that a lot, even though I didn't come up with that idea. I think it's pretty good. 
Uh, that yeah, you are uh, you're ha you're enjoying Swaraj. The minute you say you can't coerce me, what are you going to do? Put me in jail? Go ahead. I don't care. Mm -hmm. So you are experiencing Swaraj, and that also touches on another element that we have to discuss, and that is the visioning element. Having a vivid imagination of what you're going for, how to use that, how not to use it. I hope we're going to get to discuss that. Um, but also, what Gandhi said was actually slightly different than we will have Swaraj freedom in one year. He said, if you give me your complete cooperation, we will have Swaraj in one year. And they didn't. He said, I guess you didn't give me your complete cooperation, which was perfectly true. Um, but now remember we discussed the ouster of uh, Augusto Pinochet in Chile. And we said that he was not persuaded to leave office because he had been filled with love for the Chilean people. He was booted out. And I was not willing to say that this was the wrong thing to do because there are times when you have to do the best that you can because the consequences of not doing so will be worse. Uh, for example, in the previous semester, we talked about the uh, Central High in uh, Alabama being integrated by somewhat forcible, not somewhat forcible means. The 101st Airborne <laughs> comes trooping into class with all their boots and their grenades and rifles and radios and stuff. They forced that school to be integrated. And we discussed that at some length, and we said that this was not the ideal way to do it, but the ideal way to do it would have taken so long that maybe this opportunity would have slipped away. So, okay, here they are. Y you did very well to raise that point, right, but here they are. They're on their way into Belgrade. There is a limit to the amount of time and attention the average person who has to work for a living can put into an uprising. Yeah. We have, have to realize that if you are that, – that's one of the reasons that we don't succeed, uh, so, that we succeed so little. We are not professional resistors. You know, if we go out every single day, who's going to take care of the cat? Things like that. So for these pragmatic reasons, and because you have people's passions focused on this now, and because you know perfectly well that if Milosevic, President Milosevic, stays around, he's going to use his power and influence and mil military might to consolidate his hold, they really did have to act if they wanted to get him out of office. And they, they really had to be prepared to bulldoze trucks out of their way. So uh, I don't know exactly where we're coming out with this. I, I guess what I would say is if they'd come and ask me, if I was sitting drumming the table, they'd, God, I hope they come and ask me. They <laughs> didn't, of course. But uh, if they were to come and ask me, I would not have argued against that in, that, in, a, in the moment. But I would have said, here's why this is not the ideal way to do it. I hope you don't have to use them. And let's prepare better the next time so we can walk into Belgrade and nobody can stop us and we don't have to use coercion at all. But let's face it, that would have taken years and years. Look, you had this – the cute guy, I keep forgetting his name. He said, we had no idea somebody had written a book about this. They were starting from, from zero. Okay, this is excellent. Other observations? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Until they out to yeah. The yeah. Yeah. And realistically, I think, given the way most industrial societies are set up, that this is how a lot of these uprisings have to happen for various reasons. And students have the idealism. I mean, why do you think I come here? I, I could be out writing a great American novel or <laughs> being a failed a bluegrass musician. There's any number of careers I could have <laughs> failed at. <laughs> but uh, I don't think we need to elaborate on it, but students have a unique position and a unique energy. And it's 
everything of value has started with that. But then it also has to move beyond it. Uh, and we will see some exceptions to this when we talk about the uprisings that are going on in non-industrial sectors or non-industrial countries. And namely, when we talk about things going on in the Philippines and in India and in Africa, they will not necessarily be students. In Nigeria, it's village wives going down and shutting down oil companies and things like that. But for this kind of society, it, it's going to have to start with students, but it can't stop it. Uh, I think this perhaps was one of the mistakes, and I hope you've read that article by Michael True carefully that's in our reader. One of the mistakes of the uh, of Tiananmen uprising was there wasn't enough of an outreach to other parts of the community. In fact, I was hoping against hope that those students would leave the square and go back to their campuses, factories, villages, and start building the democratic reforms. But in staying in the square, they made two mistakes. They failed to get out beyond their own circle. And the big mistake, the one that I'm constantly harping on, I hope you'll not get disgusted with this, but it was a symbol. The square was a symbol of the possession of China. And that was not exactly the right symbol. Not to mention the, the goddess of liberty statue, which looked like it was westernizing. Okay. Joanne, did you have your hand up? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's right. Yeah, good point. In case you didn't hear it, they, they made a very interesting comment about leadership. There were people who had a leadership position, and, you know, especially if they were cute. They got to be on the camera all the time. But um, they said, did you remember what they said about leadership? Yeah, Matthias? Well, they stayed in the branches. They decentralized it. That's for sure. Yeah, they decentralized it. They also used another phrase, Catherine. Yeah. Uh, arrested okay. the entire thing would fall apart. Yeah. Let me get back to that in a second. But they used the term layers of leadership. So they had it, – it's not like it wasn't structured. And it's not like – it was not exactly like affinity groups. Well, no, wait a minute. I take that back. Uh, I've never been in an affinity group, so I possibly don't know what I'm talking about here. I think affinity groups have representatives that meet at a higher <coughs> level, and so there is kind of a tree and there are kind of layers. <coughs> but anyway, Catherine is raising the strategic value of not having a single identifiable leader. Uh, I'll tell you one kind of anguishing example of how damaging it can be to not have that precaution in uh, El Salvador. Uh, some people came into a village and said, we'd like you to elect leaders. We're going to have a new democracy here in this country, and we need democratic leaders. So the villagers very uh, enthusiastically elected these leaders. And it turned out that those people were paramilitaries. They came back the next day, and they killed everybody who had been elected as leaders. So, you know, strategically, stick your head off. It's going to stick your head up. It might get cut off. So there is that strategic reason. However, I also think that there's a deeper reason, and that is if you're doing principled nonviolence, you're really aiming at not reforming the system but replacing it. And you want to replace it with a system in which human beings and human will are paramount and they are not subject to manipulation. And for that, you do have to develop a more a different kind of community organizing. And so this might have been, this layers of leadership might have been the germ of alternative institutions, which is the most important part of constructive program. Maybe it's the most important, it's certainly an important part. Very good. So this is working very well. Sam, did you have? Okay. Yes, your name is? I'm Christine. Christine. Uh -huh. like parodies off of what the government was doing or coming, I think one of them was talking about how 
whenever people said things to them, they always like came back with a joke. And yes. <laughs> although it was like serious material, though, I think yeah. that was important how they kept the balance of like yeah. this is really important and we're really serious about it, but yeah. in a sort of more friendly way. Yeah. I also think that that's important, and I think that the role of humor throughout this whole thing was important, and that's why uh, you actually have people today who uh, this they formed an organization called Clowns Without Borders, <laughs> and they will actually do things like they'll go to checkpoints where you have these very grim-faced guards who are stopping people from getting through and the people are very upset and the guards are very upset and then the clown will come along dressed in a clown costume and go, like, hi, I'm Bobo the Clown and just uh, changes the whole thing. Uh, you know, there are maybe some limits to how far you can go with this, but uh, and Matthias? Is that, is that where Patch involved? That's where Patch Adams is involved, yeah. Uh, they, also go, they also go to the hospital. Yes. Yes, they do humanitarian work as well. Yeah. And humor is a, has a, is a therapeutic reality. There's no question about it. But we're talking about using it to break up the conflict dynamic. And to keep, I guess we haven't really quite totally talked about this here, but in a conflict, the opponent is telling you you are subordinate. We are separate, and as long as you go along with that, either by saying I'm afraid of you or I'm angry at you, you're in his framework. But if you do something completely off the wall, completely unexpected, completely inappropriate, as it may seem, you're breaking up that mentality. And you're doing that by yourself. You can also have third parties do that. So the role of humor in keep keeping people from getting tense, thus keeping them from getting burned out, most importantly, not going along with the threat power. Yeah, Matthias and then Amy. What I also really, really liked um, was the, the strike. Yeah. Number one, when the, the coal miners, I don't know, yeah. were, they started it early. They said yeah. there were 17,000 people. They, yeah. they sent it down, and then half the streets were just yeah. third of people. Right, so the coal miners went on strike. Last semester, we discussed this critical moment in 1913 where Gandhi's movement up to that point had mostly involved free Indians, not laborers. And suddenly, due to a, uh, an atrocity committed by the other side, <coughs> suddenly women were involved. And then suddenly, there was a, the, the women went to Newcastle to talk, about, to talk to the miners. The next thing you knew, you had 6,000 miners out on strike, so that brought labor into it. Remember when we read that introductory section to Pat Parkman's book on uh, El Salvador and the other three uprisings in Central America, she tried to distinguish very carefully between a labor strike and a civic strike, which can include labor. So that's what this consisted of. It was a civic strike, it was a strike against the regime, it was insurrectionary, but it brought in labor, which is a, a powerful element, especially, you know, where they say two-thirds of their electricity is coming out of that one mine. Incidentally, a very similar thing had happened a little bit before in Kosovo, where there was a mine up in the north, and the miners went out on strike. Very similar reason. Amy? Oh, it doesn't matter. Okay. I bet it does matter, actually. But <laughs> Can we stop? Um, Yeah. By a small group of people, yeah. uh, or by a large group of people, more repression just uh, yes. spread the protest. And then? And then more repression. Oh. Yeah, yeah, but then what about all that repression? So you want to use a technical term here? Amuse and. Yeah. Paradox. Yes. Repression. When you use too much repression, you're going to get into the paradox of repression. So this is a very interesting three-step dynamic. I don't think we ever quite put it together in this form. You have a dominating regime. As long as it's perceived as legitimate, it can get away with using a lot of repression. Though there is a point at which, if it uses too much repression, it will lose its legitimacy. 
But what you're saying here, Marisa, is that it lost its legitimacy first, and then it had to escalate the repression a lot in order to get back to the status quo, and it was impossible. Gotov, yay, he's finished. You know, it's all over. Now, if we have time and we actually, you know, do our, you know, who are the players, what's the situation, and so forth, we we'll see that uh, somewhat taking away from our point is the fact that people were getting sick and tired of Slobodan Milosevic. The economy was faltering, they had 10-year-old shoes. More than that, I would say. Uh, Serbia was acutely embarrassed by its treatment of the Kosovars, the ethnic Albanians. We haven't had a chance to talk about that, but it was a very passionate movement and I was personally quite involved in it. And it's again, it started with students at the University of Pristina. They went out every single day at noon. There were 20,000 of them uh, joined, you know, by other people, 20,000 people striking in Pristina, in Drenica and other cities of the Kosovar region. Uh, they withstood brutal repression, water, <coughs> water cannons, the whole thing, it's like you saw in the other movie, and they started to succeed. Uh, the Belgrade regime, I mean to back up for just a second, in the 1970s there was a constitution for Yugos Yugoslavia which gave Kosovo some uh, independence. Not independence, but autonomy. And one of the things that they allowed them to do was teach classes in the Albanian language. Uh, then Milosevic started taking that away. And incidentally, I saw a documentary based on this and I saw a speech by Milosevic with subtitles. And I have to tell you, he was one mean blankety blankety blank. He was a very vicious, cold, angry, hateful person at that point. Or rather, perhaps we should say, his Buddha nature was completely covered over <laughs> by anger, hatred, and if there ever was a leader who betrayed his responsibility and instigated hatred as a, as a tool for his own political power, it was Milosevic. I mean, you came away shattered by what you saw. Anyway, he started pulling back the 1970s constitution and the students struck and eventually they won the right to go back into the University of Pristina and to teach in the Albanian language. So they were on a roll. What happened? Tragically enough, there was a subgroup called the KLA, uh, which was armed militants, and they, they showed up at a uh, funeral in Drenica with masks and AK-47s or wherever they are, and said, you know, this, we've got to win back our freedom. And at that point, oh, this is so infuriating. At that point, there's a huge amount of press coverage for the guy with the mask and the gun. There had been nothing for the 20,000 people withstanding the pressure. A friend of mine who went over there said he had never seen such courage in 30 years of witnessing nonviolent insurrections all over the world. That's how strong it was. Um, I'm sorry, people, I need one of those reminders again. What were we talking about when I launched into this thing about House of Hope? Um. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, Alex. We've got to keep track of all the people who get us back on course here. This is very useful. Yeah, so what I was saying was if we stack it up and say, let's look at the situation, what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses, the fact is that people were fed up with Milosevic. Especially they were ashamed at the brutality of what they had done to the Kosovars. They were, first of all, there was this whole, whole breakup of former Yugoslavia. They started using, shipping people into concentration camps with cattle cars again. And Europeans were saying there's a part of Europe that is not Europe. And they were demonizing them and dehumanizing them. That hurts a lot and there were people saying, I read statements by Serbs who said, we, you know, I don't know what we did wrong. We had 10 years under Milosevic and now NATO, referring to the bombing campaign. 
So the fact that Milosevic wasn't popular and it was time for him to leave already kind of weakens our case a little bit. But let's face it, he never would have left power without a nonviolent uprising. And let's not forget that you had 11 weeks, 78 days of NATO bombing <coughs> costing $3 billion versus four days of student uprising costing $25 million. You had, I don't know how many people were killed in that NATO bombing. It was a horrendous setback. The iconic picture is of a bridge in, uh, I don't remember what city after there was a famous bridge because it was destroyed by Nazi bombardment in World War II and the, the Yugoslavs felt they had come back to life when they rebuilt that bridge only to have NATO bomb it down back down. Yeah. I think it's in Mostar. Mostar, that's right. Very, thank you. It's a famous bridge it's in Mostar. There's also, um, you might be thinking of a different bridge. There's lots of bridges in Yugoslavia. Really? The Mostar Bridge is famous because there's a Croatian side and a Serb side and this kind of the two peoples were able to mingle okay. in this bridge and it was li deliberately blown up by the Yugoslavs themselves. Okay. So that's uh, another tragic symbolic bridge story. But anyway, uh, I remember Arundhati Roy here on this campus in Northgate Hall, so let's hear it from Northgate Hall finally, saying that she had read, because she's very, she's un, not unlike a lot of Indians, she, for her, animals are just about as important as people in terms of suffering and stuff. She said, the bombing was so horrendous that the tiger in the Belgrade Zoo went insane and started gnawing itself. Just to, to show you how horrific that was. And what did it accomplish? Exactly the opposite of what they set out to do. And this has been documented in case after case after case that bombing civilians from the air is such a repugnant, horrendous thing to do that it rallies forces around the <coughs> dictators that you're trying to unseat. So do remember that because the numbers are helpful here. And you can uh, explain to people what the power of nonviolence is by just stacking up this simple comparative chart. I mean, $25 million sounds like a lot of money to somebody like me who you know, doesn't even get paid for what he does. But, <laughs> but um, $25 million, probably we run through that in, in five minutes. You know, I'm just making a rough guess. Apparently, the figures that we read about the costs of the Iraq invasion are grotesquely understated, and I've read things that are as high as. 2.6 trillion dollars, trillion with a T, dollars, what that has cost us. To accomplish something which they could have done for practically nothing because as we know, there was a very successful popular nonviolent uprising in Iraq in 1938. We could have built on that and we would have had everything we want, they would have had everything they want. <sighs> okay. So let's, anything else before I, yes. Um, can I ask yes. a question about um, when they actually got to Belgrade and then they burned the settlement? Yeah, okay. Is that, well, there's not <laughs> the like cute guy or whatever, he said yeah. that it was kind of just like child's play yes. compared to all the bombing, but does that yes. really justify it? Like okay, I'm really glad you picked up on that. So they, they get into the building and the next thing you know, uh, one of the offices is on fire. They're trashing this broken windows, and obviously they asked him about this. Is this nonviolence? And obviously he hasn't taken this course, and he says that it's child's play. Now, if we're sitting with him in a coffee shop somewhere in Belgrade, and we say, look, this is off the record, but I want to tell you something, what would we tell him? Nagler's Law, we would tell him. He would say, Sto? What? <laughs> uh, that's Russian. It's as close as I can come to serve a Croatian at this point. Um, so, and you would explain. Nagler's Law states that there's something qualitative rather than quantitative about violence and that introducing a little violence powerfully vitiates nonviolence. So, 
if you were that cute guy and you had been asked that question, what would you have said? Knowing full well you're soon going to be serving in the Serbian parliament. Anybody say Michael? Well, uh, okay, denounce, uh, that might be a little bit too strong. Uh, I would say, what I would do, uh, ask me, is I would say I'm sorry. We, we didn't have perfect control. That part of it slipped out. Um, <coughs> but, but then I might go on to say, Michael Nagler said on television, <laughs> you know, most real events are not perfect. So uh, he, he gave it, he, he sort of excused it and said it's okay be, because comparatively it was nothing. And I don't think that argument actually applies. But I think the argument that does apply is, you know, hey, we had to do it this when we did it and uh, it wasn't perfect and we're going to try to do better next time. If anyone, if anyone tries to do better next time, I think, you know, they get a very, very wide margin of mistakes. So that's what I would have said. Okay. What else? I think the timing is good here. I think I'm going to, whoops, I'm going to need about 10 minutes probably to touch on my stuff that hasn't come up yet. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. This is uh, John's point. I think it ties in with something you said earlier, Christine. I'm, I'm not sure, but it's interesting. My own reaction to that, the first, and of course they pull that out as the motto for the film, that we succeeded because we loved life. And the first six or eight times I saw this film, I was, yes. Love life, Lachaim, gung ho. This, this is, uh, is great. I'm totally in favor of this. But this last time around, I caught another phrase which I didn't like as much. And then he said, We love life and we don't. That made me extremely nervous. Anybody want to talk about that? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, what, what John is saying is that like the two separate, well, let's say two separate animals here. One that loves life, one that does not. <coughs> and remember what the Buddha said. It, 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 the Buddha said a lot, actually. And in this <laughs> particular case, what I'm invoking is he said, all creatures love life. All, people, all creatures shun harm. Therefore, do not kill or cause to kill. Na hante na hanyate. This is a very important uh, little statement. Do not kill. Do not cause to kill. And it shows that the Buddha was perfectly aware of what we call today structural violence. Do not kill directly. Do not help other people kill. Do not even buy products which help other people. I don't help that in any way. Okay. But the, it's the first part of the statement that's particularly relevant for us here, and that is that all creatures love life. And it struck me now, if I fall back on my own terminology, that to some degree what the Upcor students were doing was dehumanizing the opposition. And if you deny that a person loves life, you are dehumanizing. And that's also part of saying which the Otpur students disproved, that they will listen only to force. Now, you are blissfully too young, I hope, to have gone through the kind of education, quote unquote, that I went through. But looking back on my education, there were some things that really infuriated me about it. There's the whole physics thing, but we won't get into that here. But what I was taught about geography, first of all, what I was taught about any given country in the world was what product do we get out of that country? Like Bolivia equals tin. You know, we'd march in and take a little test and say, Bolivia, we would put tin. 
Very good, Michael. Go home, tell your parents. No, I just know, I just know Bolivians. You know, so that's why today you have Evo Morales and, and the indigenous government. Uh, but the thing that I think actually did more damage was countries who would be described as life is cheap in blank, fill in the blank of that country. So, and that persisted until the Korean War when the Chinese invaded but in masses, in mass infantry invasions, knowing full well that they'd lose a lot of people. The people who've been educated in my era would be going around saying, see, I told you, they don't love life. And I've come to feel that this is the most dehumanizing thing that you can believe about another person, that they don't have the same love of life inside them as you do. It's also going to make it very hard to find where they can be reached nonviolently. Because it is exactly that that you're going to be appealing to. Actually. Yeah. I think it also um, invalidates your causes as enlightened because the idea of enlightenment is not to is to know it's better than everyone else, it's to have you want everyone to realize that no yeah. one is better than everyone else. You know, yeah. So it kind of completely I don't know, it just it sort of cuts let, it off the very good point. What they were doing was reorganizing the superiority, inferiority rather than abolishing. So you have people uh, like Kostunica saying that Serbia is going to be for all the ethnics, ethnicities in Serbia. And that was a, actually, it may sound like just a casual remark, but that was a very dramatic, possibly dangerous thing to say in that era. <coughs> um, but the reality of it was to get all of that out of your own psyche is not that easy. The temptation to demonize or dehumanize the other is something you really, really have to be careful about. So, okay, it's clear we're, you know, let it be clear. We're not blaming these people. They were kids. They knew nothing. You know, they have these couple of books by James Sharp. And uh, they did brilliantly give them what they had to go on. But here's how we would like to see it go further. Um, okay. Uh, the aftermath of the uprising, partly very good, partly not so good. The not so good part I'll do first. Uh, Zoran Jinjic, uh, the one opposition leader, he had been the mayor of Belgrade. Uh, charismatic, it's a lot more charismatic than Kostunica to me. And the two of them were sort of rivals. And, but as a matter of fact, Jinjic on March 13th, of 2003 was assassinated by uh, one, an element within what had formerly been the police command of Milosevic. So, and this was a devastating blow to the Serbs. They felt like they had left all of that behind them and they were finally going forward. And you still had these people in there who had not gone through any conversion, had not gone through any persuasion. And they regarded Djindjic as a traitor to Serbia, Serbian nationalism cutting both ways, extremely tricky thing there. And uh, they just uh, shot him with a high-powered rifle on his way to work one day. Similarly, um, I think on the level, in terms of democracy, in terms of the economy, Serbia has bounced back, but not all that much mainly because it, there wasn't a whole lot of constructive program in the movement. It was an insurrectionary movement, pure and simple. One other little element I want to mention, and then I'll have just enough time, I think, for my the going to the positive side of the sequel. There was something that flashed on the scene for about 15 seconds. It probably meant nothing to you, but you may have heard me jumping up and down and clapping my hands and getting very excited. Well, compatible with professorial dignity, of course. I understand that. But that was the scene where the camera is panning along this crowd that's outside the uh, building, the front of the building. And you see an old guy sitting on the sidewalk with a funny instrument going like this, singing ya da 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 And who was that man? Anybody know the history of this region? 
He was a Guzlar. Now that's enlightening, isn't it? Uh, a Guzlar is a person who plays a Guzlar, which is that instrument that he is playing. And the point is that <coughs> these people were the conservators and the continuators of a deep folk-based epic tradition that I happen to know about, A, because I'm a failed folk singer in the first place. I already told you that. But B, because I was at one point a partly successful classicist and I was studying Homer. And Homer turns out to compose his poems orally. So we were desperately looking around for people who sang songs orally without using writing. And we discovered this incredible tradition in Yugoslavia. And during the occupation, uh, during the Nazi occupation, the partisans up in the mountains, which is where Marshal Tito became so uh, popular, the resistance hero, they would find themselves up there in the caves with nothing, you know, no water, no food, but somebody had a guzlak, and they would take it out, and they would start singing these old songs about how, you know, what are some of these characters? Uh, I used to remember the name. Mapping uh, Vuk Danovich or some, some, I'm, I'll have them back for you next week. All these characters. Because what's going on here is that people are digging deep into their ethnic tradition and using music to inspire themselves with pride and courage, which, of course, can cut the wrong way. But I thought it was a, just a very important little vignette that this guy shows up on the sidewalk in the year 2000 playing his uh, guzla. And we're going to see later on other examples of how important music can be. I don't want to exaggerate it, but it can be important. Um, two quick things then. The, this uprising was probably, it's the only case that I know of Political scientists are able to help me out with some more examples. It's the only case that I know of where the U.S. carried out an intervention on the side of a nonviolent uprising. The, there are something like 257 military interventions that we've racked up in the course of our nation's history. Uh, that ad number actually might be slightly lower than it should be now. But as far as I know, this is the only time that we intervened on the side of nonviolence. The motives for our doing that are unclear, to me at least. Uh, people murmur something about an oil pipeline coming from the Caspian going into Belgrade. And Milosevic had to be so anti-Western to keep his people rallied behind him. It didn't look like he'd allow us to do that. I don't know about any of that stuff. It's perfectly plausible. But um, the, whether, they, whether they had good intentions or not, the fact that the several elements, including the United States Institute of Peace, which I'd like to talk about later on when we have a little more time, went in there with educational materials and a little bit of money, helped them to produce these bumper stickers that said, you're finished, kill yourself, Slobo. I think that's what you were referring to, John. It's not exactly nonviolent towards the opponent. Um, but the fact that they went in there and did that, bought them computers, helped with the organizing, and brought in the nonviolent information from the Center for Nonviolent Sanctions. The f then that succeeded. The same people went on to package what those kids had done and offer them to other uprising. And I've done some uh, high level intense research on this. Namely, I looked it up in Wikipedia. Uh, <laughs> poor members were instrumental in inspiring and providing hands-on training to other civic youth organizations in Eastern Europe and elsewhere, including Kamara in the Republic of Georgia, which leads to the downfall of Edward Shevardnadze. Pora in the Ukraine. I suspect Pora is the Ukrainian form of Otpor. Zuber in Belarus. Mzdaft uh, in Albania. Oborana in Russia.